Hello and a very warm welcome to you all. I'm Vikas Nangia with another episode of Cyber Watch. Ladies and gentlemen, you are watching part two of our conversation on the topic evolution of cyber security from IT to OT and why OT security is critical. We continue to be in conversation with Lalit Alwalia, the founder and CEO of Digital X Force and iTrust X Force. And my second guest on the program is Edgar Captiwell, the president and CEO of Nozomi Network. So we continue to be in Silicon Valley, in SFO downtown at Nozomi Network's headquarters. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for joining us. Previous episode, both of you gave us some phenomenal insight. And Edgar, you made a very relevant point of uh, you know the mindset, which is pre-breach and post-breach, what the situation is. I'd like you to take the conversation forward. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I think last time we were talking about pre-breach. Pre-breach, um, the mindset that folks have uh, especially when it comes to industrial and critical infrastructure, uh, because this nece doesn't necessarily ha happen before, they don't get a lot of attacks, the attacks are fairly new, you can be in the mindset of, well, listen, it hasn't happened here, mm -hmm. so why do I need to invest? Or it may be hard for me to get the funds to implement. Um, so you get in this very hesitant mode where the your journey towards cyber resilience is slow mm -hmm. and with a lot of bumps. And of course, we all know what happens when you have a breach. Um, everything changes. Let's assume that you survive. I'm hoping everybody survives. But um, the funds become available. The, the cybersecurity and cyber resilience projects become a high priority. We get called all the time to, to go help customers and, and the conversation um, changes. So one of the things that we would love to help our customers through is how do you get from a pre-breach mindset to a post-breach mindset without having to experience the trauma mm -hmm. of a breach. Mm -hmm. And that's been challenging. It requires uh, education. It requires a visionary leaders to, to understand what the current environment is and engage in the more accelerated journey of a post-breach mindset without the breach. I think a lot of companies actually, they want to embrace the technology, want to, they want to have cybersecurity um, uh, in their day-to-day -day working, but you know, they do not keep the budget for cybersecurity. What would be your advice to the entrepreneurs? I think my big advice is think of the car for a second. Right. Would you ever buy a car that doesn't have brakes? I would not. Mm -hmm. And would you ever drive a car that you don't have confidence in what the brakes can do for you? Yeah. You probably will never drive that car more than 10 miles per hour. If I told you your brakes probably has a tendency to malfunction. Right. I recall of a father and a son conversation where the father asks his son, you know, what is the most important thing when you drive a car? You know, son obviously said that it's accelerator, but it's actually the brakes, you know. Exactly. So, so this is The confidence in the yeah. brakes will lead you this one. And that's exactly the reality of the digital businesses today. Most cyber attacks are also not personal. Most of them, right. they're not personal. And the, the evildoers are going after the weakest link. Mm. So I think this car ex uh, example is really good. Uh, you wanna make sure you, your car has brakes. But once all the cars have brakes, what is the next one? Well, you wanna make sure the car has a seat belt, mm -hmm. okay? And then if you have a seat belt, you're going to be more yeah. protected than anybody else. And again, going back to the example of, of a cyber attack, you want to make sure that you cover the basics because the, the evildoers, the hackers are going to go to the next victim, the one that doesn't have the bases covered. Mm. What is that going to do? Well, everybody is eventually going to have all the bases covered and then you go to the next step. So you don't have to boil the ocean from day one. Mm -hmm. You have to be more protected than anybody else, more than all your peers. Not everybody who has to, you know, eat the elephant at once, but you can just start chunk by chunk. And just like um, the automotive industry, now we have cars that have brakes, brakes yeah. seat belts, automatic, you know, ABS Sensors, systems, yeah. um, airbags everywhere, right? So how does that happen? By uh, one step at a time. Yeah, what? I think I think the the car break example is just phenomenal, and the reason why I like it is also it's not just that you got the car, you have the brake doesn't mean that it's forever. You have to once you're driving it, you need to change the brake pads time mm -hmm. and on, and that's the case with cybersecurity. Once you embrace the technology, and you take cybersecurity, it doesn't mean that you don't have to upgrade yourself. Exactly. You have to keep a constant budget for upgrading cybersecurity and OT as well. Please. So talk about that part, Lanet. So think of this. The reason why I brought that up was <clears throat> if your journey wants you to take to like 100 miles per hour 
to 150 miles per hour, the confidence in the security. Right. Braking system has to be there. Such is the nature of digital business. The mindset of like, okay, let me put less money towards cybersecurity was the all day method. Mm -hmm. My core business is physical stores or healthcare that I'm delivering like manually. What do I need to do to like put a lot of security in there? Right. But the nature of the business, especially after COVID, has become so digitized now, like healthcare. All of a sudden, everybody's like doing remote healthcare. I don't need to even see the physical offices anymore, mm -hmm. right? The transition was so fast and so quick, you could not have had without a good health, or good, good like, you know, digital health or security measures in there. So that way you need to start thinking is, this good security acumen in the deal were only gonna accelerate your business. So it's not a cost overhead mindset, it's about digital acceleration or the business acceleration mindset. Right. Once you start like putting that perspective, you will not have any issues defining that why I need this kind of budget. This is where we need like you know, the people who are res responsible for the security as well as the chief risk officer or CFOs to apply that mindset now that if I want like you no know, more accelerated growth and like you know being that or survive in this business, and that's a hard reality. Right. You're not gonna be able to survive for long if you continue like with the old mindset. That means I had to also allocate budgets for the right measures in place. Yeah. Let's understand what kind of cyber threats uh, one can expect when it comes to OT. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, uh, cyber threats are many. Ransomware we've talked about is, yes. is actually the more common one. Mm -hmm. Ransomware tends to be affecting the IT systems first, as I mentioned, in industrial uh, companies. Uh, IT and OT need to function kind of like the human body. All systems have to be working together. Um, but one of the most important companies when you have a attack, whether it's ransomware or otherwise, in an industrial control system is, did they get to OT? Mm -hmm. did, were they able to get to the industrial control networks that support most of your critical systems. Right. And sadly, uh, because of the lack in, of instrumentation that exists in industrial control mm -hmm. networks and IoT networks, you don't know. Um, so we usually have a basic top three things. A lot of people sometimes don't know where to start. Right. This is like, oh, an insurmountable They're lost, challenge. You know, They're lost. Yeah. Uh, we usually recommend three places to start. The one, the first one is easy to remember. You cannot protect what you cannot see. Mm. So understanding uh, your attack surface is extremely important. Do you have video cameras? Do you have uh, open connections to the internet? It's like a, like a house. Right. You need to know how many windows you have. You cannot have install an alarm system without knowing how many entry ways That's there are. Right. The second thing that we recommend, um, especially when you have challenges around budgets, is to run a tabletop exercise. Mm -hmm. You sit the most relevant people from finance, from cybersecurity, from IT, and you say, okay, we got hacked. It's a tabletop, it's, it's a hypothetical. Right. But it, it, if the more real you make it, the more people realize, oh, well, if this were to happen, we may not survive. Cool. Um, and then the third one, it has to do with cyber resilience. Right. Do you know a IT shop that does not perform backups? Mm. It's very rare. Everybody right. performs backups. Correct. The Correct. number one problem with backups is not performing the backup, is the recovery. Mm. Um, so if you think about your laptop or as a consumer, well, you may mm -hmm. want to have your laptop backed up. But how many times have you recovered your laptop? How do you know that the recovery is going to work? The backup is not the important exactly. thing. It is the recovery. recovery. And as you go from a consumer um, example to a business example, not only do you have not one, but maybe 100, you know, part of just finance system, the HR system, the production system, mm -hmm. but they also need to be recovered in a certain order. And guess what? Recovering 200 mm -hmm. machines may take two months, even though you back them up every night. So again, the, the last thing you want to do is approach the topic of recovery in an emergency right. mode. Yeah. That's the last thing you want to do. Yeah. So my the third recommendation is approach the, top of, the topic of recovery when mm -hmm. it's safe and you're you know, awake and, and things are normal. Totally. Great recommendations. On that note, we'll take a quick short break over here and resume our conversation with Lalit and Edgar. Viewers, stay tuned. Lalit and Edgar, you'll be with us. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back, Lalit and Edgar. So great recommendations, uh, Edgar, from you prior to the break. What are some of the key suggestions, whatever the level of the company be, you know, 
small, medium, large. What are the top three suggestions that you give it them? Test, test, test. <laughs> automate, automate, automate. Be driven by data. That's it. These are like fundamental things right. we always recommend. Right. You know, I was just thinking as Edgar was even describing, let's say I lost my phone right now, this yeah. very moment. Yeah. And I could not find my phone. I'll be screwed up. Even though like it's in iCloud and everything else and I know, but there's certain other things that I might not have tested in six months. Right. For that matter, my own laptop machine. And I'm talking about the personal level, mm -hmm. those things. Imagine at a business level, what kind of cost you're going to do. But I also want to like bring it back to like what your other question was about the threats at large. Right. See, ransomware is very money driven, financial motivated and everything. But when the businesses and IT system get compromised and people go, they're limited to a specific organization. The impact is also limited to that, like one organization. Right. When we talk about operational technology and critical infrastructure, the largest and the biggest threat is a nation hacktism threat. Correct. This is where like the powerful nations, which got all kind of resources they can imagine coming up for the whole nation. They can cripple your whole economy in a matter of like days here, or maybe like you know, in a matter of hours. Right. Because the sophistication of attacks, you cannot defend yourself. And the day-to-day -day impact, like say my, I'm just like water supply, electricity, transportation, healthcare, or even for that matter, the countries which are highly prone to the nuclear and, and those kind of like you know, areas, you know, what we all understand from the, the World War II, the, you know, the Japan, like you know, what happened there and still you have those things. That's the kind of impact we're talking about, the actors there. Now there's also, for the monetization purposes, insider attack for the fraud. I gave you one example back in the days, like eight years back, nine years back, there was someone who was the only person who needed water supply, like you know, in Southern California. And he was not happy with his promotion or the performance rating. He locked everything and went home. He didn't have to show off for seven days. Yeah. There was no one to really come, and this was the kind of operational impact. No water supply, nothing for the whole seven days. They couldn't track it down. Right. It wasn't even a backup of the resilience. It was like dependency on the insider, malicious or non-malicious. These are the real threats we're talking about. We had instances like Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Go back, not too long time back. Right. Just to prove my point and the social cause, what they really ended up, the havoc. And the government had to pay the price for that. So these are the real threats that are really happening and operational technology and critical infrastructure is right at the center of all that. Coming back to your point, Edgar, the attack is always on the weakest link. Developing nations, which are short of resources, they could be the weakest link, but the data is all there. What are some significant inputs that you can give over here? It's not so much about the resources. The primary benefit is the deterrence factor. The fact that you know that if you hurt us, we're gonna go after you. And I think that was a great example uh, during Colonial Pipeline. You may remember that Colonial Pipeline was actually the mm -hmm. third or fourth in that four month period uh, attack. Right, and then, they were and then, bad attacks. And so I think right. so, some folks were saying, well, has the United States lost its deterrence capabilities? Because mm -hmm. now people think they can attack freely. Right. And, and I think the consequences uh, to the bad actors on, on Colonial Pipeline and others have, have brought deterrence back. So deterrence is more than resources is, is a factor that affects and protects uh, societies. And to your point, now going back to the folks that don't have it, um, what should they do? Well, listen, protection is, is critical. Um, so you know, the ability of these folks to monetize uptime is, is universal. It affects um, everybody. They're always gonna go after the largest rewards, the folks that pay, um, and the, that is proportional to folks, um, to the number of folks um, affected. Absolutely. And to, just to add to that, right, we talk about extensively public-private partnerships. Right. It, it's not just government job, it's not just private sector job. You gotta partner because we're all learning in our own ways, so sharing those experiences is important. With something like critical infrastructure, you gotta have the international cooperation, those treaties, mm -hmm. right? where you have to like beyond your own motivations, like of nation one, nation two, you are sharing that because no one nation is aloof to this. Right. If something's happening some part of the Europe, they're 
responsibility to share with both developed and developing countries and, and wherever so that they can be more prepared for those things really coming. Now, complement that with like, you know, if you look around, when we are going, when we are at a global presence. Right. During this global presence, you know, we go to like continent A or country A, everybody is trying to manage the sovereignty of your services and the data mm -hmm. now for a reason. That was not like such a big trend. It used to be, in fact, U.S., okay, everything what we do in U.S. need to stay in U.S. Now, every country doesn't matter from China to UAE to like Australia, wherever you go, they want everything we hosted within the realms right. because they don't want to let the control go. Now, on the one hand, I can understand why they're trying to do that so that tomorrow when somebody say, decides, okay, let's cut it out, just like how we're seeing somewhat of between Indo and China, like, no, sorry, uh, the U.S. and China relationships. They want to keep the control of that. Nevertheless, there are few things which impact the global, like with the globalization in mind, not one nation in mind. That's how we really see like these treaties or like, like you know, the partnerships between nation and nation. They have to be bolstered when it comes to mm -hmm. the critical infrastructure and they need to take initiatives, like even like you know, some private institute, hey, can you like bring this model and apply as a global standard now? Yeah. We still have to stop thinking about the mindset of one entity, one localization, one region because this is, impacts everyone, everywhere. Yeah, we'll take another short break over here on the other side of the break. Uh, when we return back, we'll first take a quick look at the CyberWatch News Flash. We'll be right back after these messages. <music> Welcome back, you're watching CyberWatch. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching the part two of our conversation on the topic evolution of cybersecurity from IT to OT and why OT security is critical. We continue to be in SFO downtown at the Nazobi Network's office. I have with me Lalit Alawalia and Edgar Capdeville. Now, before we resume back to our conversation, first, let's take a quick look at the CyberWatch News Flash. Christie's auction house discloses data breach impacting 45,000 individuals after a ransomware attack. The renowned auction house Christie's has informed authorities of a significant data breach affecting approximately 45,000 individuals. The intrusion, discovered on May 9th, resulted from a recent ransomware attack during which the attackers managed to steal sensitive files containing personal information. According to the notification letter submitted to the main attorney general, the compromised data includes names, driver's license numbers and non-driver identification card numbers. However, the full extent of the data breach remains uncertain as impacted individuals are being offered a 12-month subscription to identify theft and fraud monitoring services, suggesting that more sensitive information may have been compromised. The ransomware group known as Ransom Hub has taken credit for the attack, claiming to have stolen a broader range of data, including names, birth dates, addresses and information from identification documents. The group further asserted that they had obtained information belonging to at least 500,000 Christie's clients worldwide, although cyber criminals often exaggerate such claims. All right, once again, Lalit and Edgar, thank you so very much for joining us and sharing uh, your knowledge and expertise with our viewers. Where do you see the position of United States when we speak specifically about critical infrastructure and OT uh, in comparison to Europe and the rest of the world? Well, first of all, let's talk about the, the role of government. I think the role of government has been very uh, important and very significant. To do a very quick analogy to the previous car example, the automotive industry has been advanced so fast right. uh, with a, um, regards to safety mm -hmm. because even if Lalit and I got together today and formed a car company, mm -hmm. we couldn't ship a car without seat belts yeah. without brakes we, we cannot it's illegal um, how come we can operate a plant with cybersecurity? Right. right so I think governments are creating the frameworks the US has been um, especially uh, with the formation of CISA mm -hmm. and uh, under the leadership of Jenny Sterling has been fantastic in providing guidelines to the pipeline industry to the airport industry um, oil and gas um, it, it has been um, good guidance to where the standard, where the bar is, um, where the bar needs to be uh, in Europe. And in the United States and Europe, we have now the NIST two, NIST two standards. 
Uh, Australia has been aggressively adopting standards and actually naming uh, industries that need to comply to those standards. So I think governments have a role to play mm -hmm. in terms of accelerating um, critical infrastructure and cybersecurity protection for the benefits of all the citizens and for the benefit of the nation. Uh, Lalit, if you recall a few episodes earlier, we spoke a little about the need of having an international organization which collectively brings all the countries or the governments under one umbrella. Is that a possibility, though? We did form the United Nations, didn't we? <laughs> yes. There was a reason why UN was formed. Right. At that time, the need was physical in a world coalition. Right. Digital world coalition has to happen very soon, and digital security is going to be the first and forefront of that. Right. So would we not have something like United Nations Security Council? I, I can see a like, very near future possibility of that happening, where the organizations such as CISA or other like, you know, organizations, plus like, you know, participation from all the countries around the world is going to be very important and super critical. Sharing, exchanging ideas, or even have the governance and the steering committee, the veto powers, like what we can do or not do, because it's not going to be in just, just your purview right. to do this. We all need that. I can see very well a possibility of that happening. But I would also see, like, you know, these things, we should not solely rely on the governments either. Hmm. These are, like, the fundamental building blocks. We, just like, you know, governments are not formed on their own. Who forms the government? The people. Right. The United Nations, who, who elects who's going to be next president or, like, you know, next president and, like, in everything. This is a role of everyone's, you know, day to day because we are going to get impacted in the whole thing. Right. We have to start demanding, and I would like, you know, I think we talked about this one. Moving forward, because of digitization, whether it's the plans like operational technology or IT, we talk the concept of digital trust code. Right. If any time I consume a digital service, whether it's a self-driving car, the space tourism, the remote healthcare, I better be asking, show me your digital trust score, mm. which is not just formed with one-time assessment or like this and everything or what you think and I think. Right. Over the period of time being calculated so that we all have a common parameter and a trust or reliability into that. A great input. This great. is already happening actually quite a bit. Uh, if you think about um, consumers demanding in the case of mm -hmm. investors, and we always say that serendipity is not coincidental. So mm -hmm. just like we have CISA moving on one side of the house in the United States, from another side of the house in the United States, we have the SEC. Mm -hmm. So the SEC issued its cybersecurity rulings. Uh, this is to protect investors. So investors invest in companies, and there is no standard way of reporting what is the cybersecurity stance of the companies that you invest. And as Lalit is saying, this gives the power to investors to decide, I'm going to decide on this investment, whether it's a good investment or a bad investment, knowing what their cybersecurity stance is. So what the SEC ruling did is require companies, industrial or not, to report on cybersecurity incidents, but also report on their cybersecurity stance. So very similar to when we protected investors against fraud with Sarbanes-Oxley, just the fact that you're yes. putting out there what your financial controls are, right. and then I can make a decision whether I want to invest in your company or not based on your ability to protect me against fraud in your company. Now I can make a, de a decision as to whether I invest in your company or not based on your cybersecurity stance. So again, serendipity is not coincidental. We have CISA making progress on one side. We have the SEC making progress on another side. And at the end of the day, whether it's with a centralized, organized cybersecurity global entity or all of us um, tightening the knobs, uh, we're going to get there. Well, on that note, we know we're going to wrap up this conversation. Um, any closing remarks? I will do something very quick. The three things that we just talked about. Number one, you have to understand um, your attack surface. You can't protect what you can see. Number two, always plan for the worst case. And then number three, know how to come back. This is how we have to protect ourselves in this new digital world. And, and I believe Edgar summarized really well. All I will say is whether it's information technology or operational technology, this is everyone's responsibility. So better understand the risk, ask the right questions, and demand what's rightfully yours. Do not just like really fall you know, in the false perception of compliance and other things, but develop the digital trust score. Well, ladies and gentlemen, do remember that CyberWatch is powered by Digital X Force and iTrust X Force. If you have any questions, concerns, queries, or you'd like us to discuss on a particular topic, you can write us at cyberwatch at tvasiausa.com. 
And if you want to reach out to Lalit at Digital X Force and I Trust X Force, Lalit, what's the best way out? Through our websites, digitalxforce.com and itrustxforce.com, or through our LinkedIn channels. We're always available, and through partner sites and such as Nozomi, we'll make sure we bring the right solution, the right services to you. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for joining us and sharing your knowledge and expertise with our viewers. Until next time, viewers, this is Vikas Nange signing off. Thank you for watching.